Some gave us roads, but stories as well? Let's find out more in the House of Ravel. <laughs> I'm Ingmar Hughes. And welcome to the second episode of House House of of Rebels. So we are the British theatre podcast. Well, not the British. There's probably other... With the British theatre. With the British British theatre podcast. So in today's episode, we're going to be looking at Roman theatre. Roman theatre in general and Roman theatre in Britain. Because there's not a lot of information known about the specifics of Roman theatre in I think we can definitely assume that Roman theatre would have been transposed to, to oh, Britain. Oh, yeah, for sure. One of those things that are kind of like in any colony ever, yeah. um, people people from, from the homeland would bring their culture and would very much try and do it there. That's so. basically what, what I'm working on the assumption um, that most of the theatre performed in the UK during the kind of Roman... Era. Era was... Roman theatre mm-hmm. from Rome. So, kicking off, we have the context of Roman theatre in Britain. So, let's brush up on our history. Okay. So, the Roman conquest of Britain occurred in 43 AD, when Emperor Claudius organised the final invasion of Britain. So, there have been two other attempts about 100 years before in 55 BC and 54 BC. Romans remained in Britain for 400 years, from 43 AD to 410 AD. Yeah, that sounds rough. When they kind of left because then the Roman Empire was kind of flailing a bit and they were like, oh, we might come back later, and they just left. I think they probably assumed they were going to come back and then... Anyway, so with the arrival of the Romans, Mm. we have the beginning of theatre as we know it in Britain, obviously, as well as things like roads and concrete Mm. and Londinium and all those wavy names. As Monty Python said, what did the Romans ever do for us? Basically everything. So as we discussed in the last episode, before Romans came to Britain, we mainly had fireside traditions of storytelling and things like that. And so what Romans did was brought mass entertainment. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about Roman theatre, it's important to talk about the differentiation between amphitheatres and theatres. So amphitheatres were... Amphitheatres. Amphitheatres. Sounds like you're... (laughs) My pronunciation is so off today. I just imagine it kind of like if you were going to the theatre and instead they just get an arm amputated on the way in and out. You know, that's your ticket. <laughs> okay, let's rewind. <laughs> How am I supposed to be saying it, Mingma? Amphitheatre. Amphitheatre. Yes. This is going to be a very pronunciation <laughs> difficult. I'm going to struggle with these Greek, uh, with these Latin. It's going to be great. It's great. No one knows how to pronounce the Latin. It's let's great. rewind. So, um. <laughs> just gonna find no, no, that's right, that's right, I'm only that's saying right. it for this one bit so amphitheatres and theatres in Roman Britain were very different things mm-hmm. so amphitheatres were circular or oval they were major public venues they had seating that surrounded a central performance area mm-hmm. like a modern open air stadium so like when we think of the Colosseum, boom, big yeah. thing in the middle, things all around mm-hmm. so they hosted events such as races and gladiatorial Combat. Stabby stabby is what I was going to say, but combat works as well. (laughs) So Roman theatres were heavily influenced by Greek theatres. So they were built in semicircles, um, constructed from Roman concrete, and had much better acoustics. They would host plays, pantomimes, choral events, orations, and commerce. There were tiered seating, often built into a hillside if available, but the Romans weren't that fussy about if there was hillside. They'd go like, oh, there's a hill, that's happy. In Britain, we have one known Roman theatre that still survives to this day. This is where the pronunciation's going to get me. The Verulamium. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Verulamium. I'm going to commit to it. Yeah. Verulamium yeah. Roman theatre in St Albans. So this was built in about 140. AD by about 300 AD it could seat about 2000 spectators. They do still have productions there. Really? Where, yeah, when covid struck, I think they can currently seat about 
275 people mm. um and then i think in july they started doing a couple more performances and they could see about 225 mm -hmm. but you can go and visit it looks very nice it was found by discovered by this farmer who just saw some kind of stone and went oh what's this and then just sort of went this might be important um <laughs> i love that honestly so, uh check it out there are some really mm. interesting photos of it um but yeah so that's it's the only known theater roman theater um in England. So are you also saying that when COVID struck that they just started productions there again? Because I it was don't, like I think no, I think productions were going. Mm. I'd love it, you know. But I found an article from this pandemic we go back to the past. We go back to the past. <laughs> the origins of theatre in Britain are basically the same as the origins of Roman theatre, which in turn was heavily influenced by Greek theatre. So it kind of goes Greek theatre influenced Roman theatre, which then came to Britain, which then influenced the rest of British theatre. So not much is actually known about Roman theatre, as not much Roman theatre survived. We know that Roman drama emerged from the festival of Liber Liberalia, the celebration of a boy's entry into manhood. This festival involved a sacrifice, a procession, songs to ward off evil spirits, wearing of masks, and my favourite thing, the carrying of a giant phallus. <laughs> I thought you said vagina phallus. Vagina phallus. <laughs> I mean, I'm no, interested. That's me. No, a giant phallus. It's to kind of do with fertility. Yeah, because the Romans had amazing lamps which were dick shaped and they'd go above the kind of marital bed to help with fertility. I love it. I think we should, well, we kind of, we should probably bring that back. Really? I don't know. I was, I was committing to that and then I realised that was bullshit. Um, so I should stop. But this is my favourite thing that we come up to. So obviously my name's Olivia. Mm hmm um, and then we have the Roman historian Livy, oh. which is just so weird because you think about like obviously Livy was my childhood nickname, and then we have this Roman historian Titus Livius, nicknamed Livy. He basically wrote something like a hundred and twenty-four books talking about Roman history. And anyway, what I'm trying to say is the Roman historian Livy notes three hundred and sixty-four a. 364 BC for the appearance of theatrical shows. Mm. So these started as a way to appease the wrath of gods. Basically, what these theatrical shows were, dancing to a flute. So not quite the same as we think of. I think we definitely do need to put a point in here about mm -hmm. kind of theatre and religion. Oh uh, gosh, you yes. Know, and I think not just with, the with Roman theatre, but also partly with Celtic, um, but also moving forward, that arguably, so I don't get crucified, but <laughs> religion and ceremony now is still, th it's a type oh, yes. of theatre. And very much at this point, you know, if we're looking at it, where is the line between... Between a ritual yeah. and um, a theatre, you know, a, mm, performance, a performance, a storytelling. Mm. I mean, that's what religion is. It's kind of, well, no, I'm not saying that's what religion is. But religion is founded on stories and, you know, well, the creation you know. story and... I mean, when, when you go to kind of like Christmas Day services and, you know, and they're wafting the incense and going up and down, that's theatre, you theater. know. It's, it's theatre, it's theatre. It's I mean, a theatre of worship. They've got the robes, they've got the chorus, they've got, they've got everything. Yeah. But it's not until 240 BC that Livius Andronicus scripts the first recognised place. And this is an adaptation of a Greek tragedy, which he wrote as part of Rome's victory celebrations mm. for the First Punic War. From what remains of his work, it's suggested that he wrote about Rome's Trojan lineage. Key themes were love, lust, rage and madness. Actually, just to kind of add in there. Okay. Um, I did Latin to IB level because yes, I'm, I'm a nerd and I'm weird. But one is, again, interesting that when we're talking about history and story and this kind of thing, the Trojan lineage uh, from the Romans is entirely made up. Oh, yeah. And that's fascinating that literally um, Augustus, the emperor, employed Virgil to write the history of why the Romans are descended from the Trojans. Because they were obsessed with being connected to the Greeks, weren't they? Yes, but they yeah. wanted to be the opposite side of the Greeks. So in the kind of Trojan War, the Greeks were fighting the Trojans. And so the Romans were said, we are going to be the kind of the descendants of the Trojans. And that became their history. Mm. So we then have the next big Roman playwright. Mm. Now his name, I'm going to give a big stab at. So his name is Gnaeus Navius. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and he was instrumental in early Roman playwriting as he wrote plays about Roman history rather mm. than the standard plays about myths. But bearing in mind Roman history would be... Roman history is, is not, is history. not the history. It's, yeah. it's, it's sort of stories. Mm. 
So plays, as they were starting to develop, were performed as part of Ludi, shows accompanying religious festivals. They were linked to the games, sporting activities, um, and it wasn't until 55 BC that the first permanent theatre was built. Um, and just to give this some context, this was the same year as Julius Caesar's first invasion to Britain, his unsuccessful invasion. But mm. So it took 300 odd years for the first permanent theatre to be built. Wow. When Augustus came into power in 27 BC, he changed theatre significantly. So before Augustus, it had mainly kind of linked to religious ceremonies and games, but he kind of came in and went, right, I'm going to make this theatre malarkey fancy. Mm. So theatre had previously been a lively, interactive form, um, and kind of how I imagine, not that I've ever seen a play on Broadway, but Mm. the stories that you hear about Broadway where people kind of exclaim things and cheer things, and people in in Roman times would hiss and cheer and kind of cry and and laugh at the performance. Kind of panto for us. Pant- wait, wait, hold your panto horses, baby, there's some (laughs) very exciting panto stuff coming up. And so Augustus kind of came along and changed this, and and theatres became grander and they had more elaborate scenery. He also changed the rules of performance, and said that tragedy should consist of no more than three actors and then there should be no deus ex machina. So this is a fun sidebar where I think we can talk about deus ex machina because it's hilarious and I love it. It's my favourite thing. So a deus ex machina basically means God from the machine and it's a plot device used to solve a seemingly unsolvable problem in a story in a quick and unexpected way. Basically... It's a Roman cop out. Do you know the kind of Greek origin of it? The idea, so the idea of God from the machine comes in that there's a kind of God on a giant crane. Literally. <laughs> it comes in. So at the end of the play, there's like, oh no, the hero's got a problem. And they bring this giant crane in with this actor who kind of appears as God and goes, I've fixed all these things for you. It's amazing. It's and just... I just love it as the idea of sort of almost like in a pantomime, yeah. Peter Pan flying sort of way, this god comes yeah. in. It's, it's great because it's also Deus Ex Machina is known as kind of like a really derided thing in Hollywood as well. But it's oh, gosh, but the yeah. fact that it literally means god of machine, I think is just great. The other side of it as well is that it isn't just European theatre, and here's a real nerdy moment, but Katakali theatre in India, mm-hmm. um, they quite often have a god character who normally you see him because his face is painted blue and blue is the colour of mm. deity in Katakali but again arrives at the end of the show to finish and solve everything just very <laughs> easily it's just, it's just everyone loves a cop out it's great it's great and some kind of modern day examples would be in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets go on when mm. Harry's in the basilisk basilisk basilisk, basilisk. <laughs> oh my gosh what Harry's fighting the giant snake at the end of the movie and Forks the phoenix just sort of sweeps in mm, from nowhere. Mm, Ming was mm. looking very unhappy with me. Would you say that was an example? I kind of disagree, partly because of my undying loyalty to Harry Potter. Um, but I think, a, mm, what's a good example of modern day? Hmm. Um, I agree that there's a bit of a cop out with Forks. What's different about that is that then later on it comes back about the fact of kind of calling for help, and you know that it has it has been part of the uh, you know normally it's something ends and then suddenly everything's fine. Mm. Like oh okay happy marriage you know Hold finished. Yeah yeah, but I just think it's a really fun. I mean I'm already projecting this is going on sleight of hand and this is scoring highly for sleight of hand <laughs> because I love the idea of a god like Did the Romans and... have uh, have like the literal mechanical god in the same way as the Greeks did or did they I do this? I don't know. That's a good question. Mm. I will find out and put yeah. it in the show notes. So they have this god on the machine mm. and Augustus says no 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 so he banned them Mm -hmm. he also changed the dress requirements and ordered the seating to be set out according to rank he basically made theatre quite fancy Mm -hmm. and because of what he did tragedies became marginalised and they were replaced with um, a tell and farce mime and pantomime Mm. (sighs) and so let's work through these go on so a tell and farce is the earliest native Italian farce Probably improvisational comedy featuring masked stock characters. These characters included Maccus the Clown, Bucco, quote, Fat Cheeks, The Simpleton, <laughs> Pappus the Old Fool, Dossinus, 
whose name has been taken to mean hunchback, Mm -hmm. and Mandicus, perhaps meaning the glutton. Um, There's no record of these farces after the first century AD, but certain elements of stock characters of the 16th century Italian Commedia dell'arte show that they were influenced by Mm. these Italian farces. I love a good English pantomime. Mm. I love a good dame. I love a good he's behind you. So pantomime Mm -hmm. appeared in 22 AD, and it was incredibly popular. The performers were known as pantomimus and wore masks that kind of obscured their facial expressions and stopped them from speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, They were dressed like tragic actors in cloaks and long tunics. They performed solo, dancing and performing gestures with accompaniment by an orchestra with cymbals, flutes, pipes and trumpets. Mm -hmm. A chorus would um, sing the songs, usually adapted from well-known tragedy or a mythological story. So, as I said, pantomime in Roman times was less about dames and cross-dressing and more basically about an interpretive dance. Nice, all right. I know, I just... And the focus was mainly on the skill of these interpretive dancers mm-hmm. more than the music or the, the kind of sound. So I just... So that when you think of pantomime, it had a completely different meaning. Interesting. Very interesting. Did they literally call it pantomime as well? Yeah, pantomime. In- in- and the performers were pantomimus. <laughs> pantomimus. Pantomimus. Or mimimus. Um, mimimus. Mime, in contrast to pantomime, um, re- performed by Mimus, mm-hmm. was performed without masks. And the plot of the mime revolved usually around adultery and bad things. This is a fun fact. God. There's evidence to support the idea that actual acts of adultery were carried out on stage. What? And that, what? <laughs> and that during execution scenes, actors were replaced with convicted criminals. I mean, the Romans always liked a bit of blood and guts. So I suppose, they just but went, hell. well, why do we have to use the old cloak and dagger? We could just have sex on stage. Or, I mean, I don't think that can go into sleight of hand, I have to say, because that isn't sleight of hand <laughs> no, it's at not. all. It's not even scandal, it's just, <laughs> okay, okay. Fair enough. I mean, talk about method, you know. Very method, very method. I'm just getting a kind of, like, you know, Shakespeare in Love, the film? Vaguely, I think or like, so. You know, basically, you're not supposed to have a woman on stage, and then like he's having a list affair with. It just feels like it's literally that. It's like people can just say, "Yes, I'll be an actor because you know, then I can openly have sex with my affair partner in front of everyone, and no one's going to bat an eyelid." I think there was some um, evidence also to suggest that women also performed in on stage. Oh, great! In this time, so equality. Woo-hoo! You come up and you have sex with an actor on stage. So moving on to the plays of Roman mm-hmm. theatre. So that's a little bit about the kind of origins of the style, what kind of shows are around. We've got three surviving playwrights who we know the most about. So they are Platus, who was around from... Not Plato. Not Plato. <laughs> not Plato. Platus, who was around from 254 to 184 BC. We then have Terence. <laughs> who I love, for who was around from 186 to about 159 BC, give or take mm. 10 years. And finally, we have Seneca, who was famous for his tragedies, and he was about from 4 BC to 65 AD. So Seneca is the only one who who actually kind of crosses the Roman Britain kind of. Yeah, he crosses line. the Roman Britain line. But he was nicknamed the Prime Minister of Nero, so he was Nero's tutor. Um, and confidant, and he died because Nero told him to commit suicide, and he did. I mean, Nero, you know, literally played the violin while Rome was burning, so you know, <laughs> for exactly. To go for but the, yeah, exactly. So, so there were those three playwrights. Mm. So, a bit about each of them. So, Platus wrote about 130 plays. Wow, that's quite disputed because a lot of playwrights said that their plays were by Platus. They'd be like, I've been, I've got this play. It's by Platus. Please put it on. About, so he was like their Shakespeare. In a he kind was of like way. their Shakespeare. About mm. 21 of those plays survive. From the meter that they're written in, we know that at least half of each of the plays was sung, so they're kind of like early musical theatre. Platus used the plots of Greek plays to write his plays. He was heavily influenced by Greek new comedy. Was it kind of that he was just translating Greek plays into Latin, or was he... I mean, frankly, the Roman gods are completely ripped off from the Greeks. Is it that kind Mm. of thing? Sort of. There's a little bit of contention about were they adaptions, were they new works. Mm. Plato's put these plays in a Roman setting, so he gave things... They gave them Roman dress and Roman names and Roman towns and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Um, His plays were quite... 
rowdy. So, raunchy. What you raunchy. Were doing I was going for bawdy and then I was going for like row, rowdy and raunchy and they would normally be about. But was it the kind of thing like in Greek theatre where they quite literally had giant dicks strapped onto the outside? Was I don't, it that kind of I mean, thing? I don't <laughs> know. I'd like to imagine they were kind of plays about families and slaves mm. overcoming the masters and, you know, sons trying to seduce women and very raunchy nice chaotic beings yeah so we have platus and then we have terence Mm -hmm. now terence is an african roman playwright and he was originally a slave who was freed and he wrote six plays he only wrote six he was from ancient libya so he was therefore of berber descent and he came over to rome um when he was captured um he very sadly died he either died aged 25 or he died age 35 he basically went to greece and never returned his plays were very different to Plato's plays in that they were very refined Mm -hmm. and delicate fewer plot holes fewer dirty jokes more sophisticated Plato's was a big fan of menander and so was terence but the differences in terence's plays the prologues get ready for this basically didn't tell you about the play at all so Plato's and Menander wrote prologues that gave away the the play yeah but Terence in the kind of the shape in the kind of like households both like dignity dignity. yeah Yeah. but Terence wrote plays and sort of put the audience in suspense and he would put in his prologues a bit about his experience writing the play and and the setting of it but he never wrote about what the content of the play was and the fascinating thing about Terence is that all six of his plays survived and they were dated so we know the years in which they were performed and the order in which he wrote them he's got a huge legacy even though he only wrote six plays and then finally we move on to Seneca the Younger who was dubbed the Prime Minister of Nero he wrote about 10 tragedies with Greek subjects Mm -hmm. including Medea, Oedipus about eight of the plays are actually thought to be his um (laughs) and how many are attributed i don't think many were attributed now his plays Mm -hmm. were very violent very gory very sort of dark they didn't have a lot of gods in them mostly mostly ghosts and witches and they thought seneca's work was not written to be performed on stage they thought it was closet dramas Ah, so and you know a lot about closet dramas don't you Mingma? oh yes i'm very much looking forward to this later on for a quick overview closet dramas were what happened when theater could not be performed and in particular kind of covid times this feels very relevant but basically Mm -hmm. theater always happens even if you technically can't perform in front of people in the traditional way and this was throughout history there have been so many examples of what is it termed closet drama Mm -hmm. where perhaps this is meant to just be a poetry reading for friends like chamber music you know Mm. you'd do it in in a small room and this is where female playwrights throughout history could perform or um when there was a massive amount of censorship it's fascinating it happens in roman times as well yeah it's fascinating and the people are saying that perhaps people (laughs) we think that perhaps his plays were written um there's no record of his work being produced and they were written to be in private readings because his work was so gory mm, yeah. and gross mm. basically so yeah. i wonder if they enacted in the private readings we they have done um since seneca they have put on his plays as actual plays but i like to think that they were in a room sitting around going and then i pluck out your eyes <laughs> with this knife But those are the three main playwrights of Roman theatre. And as I said, it's highly likely that these playwrights were performed on the Roman stages of Britain. So when Britain is invaded by the Romans, these three playwrights have been in existence and we know the work. So is there nothing we know of playwrights after that time? Because it's interesting, Seneca only just overlaps. Just overlaps. There's some kind of loose work from other playwrights, but these are the three playwrights whose work survived, really. So it's again one of these things It's we again, don't know. we just don't know. And, and obviously these three playwrights never really overlapped each other, so they never met. I mean, Terence was influenced by Platus, but they never met, they never kind of had yeah. a little chat. Um, well again it's just um, whose thing survived so nowadays it's uh, yeah exactly so moving on finally (laughs) because I know I'm talking for a long time to the ranking so first of all sleight of hand I mean I'm a big fan of this god from the machine (laughs) I'm a big fan I love the idea of someone coming in the claim they also use a lot of masks a lot of songs a lot of stock characters a lot of rhythm so 
I'm giving a sleight of hand a 7 out of 10. A 7 out of 10. Because okay. I just love the idea of someone kind of being craned in. <laughs> Almost like... I mean, it's sad we don't know that the Romans did it as well, because I love the Greek one, and that's kind of a... I, I like to imagine that they did. In a sort of Shrek 2 vibe. <laughs> you know, when they've gone to get Arthur, and then, like... Prince Charming's putting on that play and he's yeah. got all the like Shrek people and he like sends people in. I that's how I imagine it. I love this. <laughs> so that's why I'm giving it a seven Shrek out of ten. Inspired. Seven out of ten. Uh I think that um Hmm. I'm wondering how much of it is actual sleight of hand. That's the kind of that's the difficulty, because it's like if someone is literally killing yourself killing you, how much of that is kinda of like cloak and dagger mag- magic tricks? Mm. That's true. Well, I don't think they were always killing people. Mm-hmm. I mean, interpretive dance, Mingma. Interpretive, interpretive dance. Interpretive dance. And mime and so-and-so. And mime and dancing to flutes and... Do they have any trap doors and this kind of stuff in the, in the staging, do we know? <sighs> we don't know. The staging became grander with Augustus in terms of, like, magic disappearing tricks. I'm not sure. Me, 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 me. I'm going to give it a five. Okay, so that gives it a 12 out of 20. Not bad. That's good. It's good. Doing well. After sleight of hand, we have scandal. I would say it's quite low on scandal, but mm-hmm. then I think it's quite hard to be scandalous when you could also be killed. Yeah. The threat of being killed creates a low scandal. Interestingly, though, Nero, who was famous for killing his own mother, mm-hmm. performed as Orestes in a mask that resembled Nero's own face. So he performed in this play as a character who killed his own mother wearing a mask of his own face. I mean, Nero is also, Nero is a fascinating one. We haven't he's, spoken he's, about, he's, he talked about death, fascinating. but you know, he, um, he, he fancied himself as a poet and as an actor. And he uh, was one of those people who, his poetry was so awful that women oh, pretended no. to give birth or men, tr- men <gasps> pretended they were dying in order to get out. Because oh otherwise you had to just keep on clapping and keep on clapping because otherwise he would kill the first person who stopped clapping. Oh and you know, he imagined himself as this, as this writer and this author. And How it, do you say no? Exactly. Well, it's also kind of like, it's, it's almost inverted scandal because it's the king. He's just kind of, you know. The king's just being really bad. Yeah. <laughs> I just can imagine him performing and people afterwards being like, what are we going to do? He's awful. Yeah. But not saying it, obviously, because they'd be killed. Yeah, I mean, like, and also he's famous for kind of like the most awful punishments and like he was true despot. Awful. In... But other than that, I couldn't find much on scandal in terms of Roman theatre. So well, I, well, come on. I mean, there's I a mean, lot of scandal. How about the affairs on the middle of the stage? I mean, affairs on the middle of the stage, that is true. There's lots of that. Yeah. So I'm giving scandal a solid four out of ten. I'll join you with four. I think four sounds good. So that brings it to eight out of twenty. Next, we have Ripple or Riot. So as we talked about, Augustus Mm -hmm. loved theatre, changed it. But after Augustus came Tiberius and he absolutely hated theatre. And he banished actors and pantos in 23 AD. It was only resurrected in Rome when Caligula... No, that's not Caligula. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) <laughs> I went, what? Kaliuga. I think, as we talked about in Scandal, it's hard for theatre at that time to cause a riot because mm. they just kill you. Yeah. I mean, Tiberius had an author executed because he criticised Agamemnon in a tragedy and Tiberius Agamemnon. thought... Agamemnon. What? What did I say? Agamemnon. I had this with Sea and Enemy the other day and it really... It's something about these words with lots of M's. Tiberius had an author executed because he criticised Agamemnon in a tragedy and Tiberius thought the author was slighting him. So he executed him. Um, Caligula as well thought people were slighting him and had the habit of throwing actors and authors and audience members into the arena. So I've listed Ripple or Riot as quite low. I've given it 4 out of 10. Because it did cause some upset. I think we could also, I think, with this idea of kind of the banishment of actors, mm. you could almost argue it's much more like, again, this is such conjecture, but you could argue that if someone is banned from Rome, they're more likely to end up in the outer colonies like Britain. That's true. So th- there could be an interesting thing there, but... Um, yeah. But actually, he they were allowed back in 37 Yeah, 80, 14 so. years later. Okay, so, so it, wasn't, it wasn't too much, and also we, they hadn't invaded much. Britain by then. <laughs> they hadn't invaded <laughs> you know, Britain. Problem. Plot. Uh, but they could have theoretically yeah. gone to, you know, a little island somewhere, Sicily, pop down. Pop down, yeah. 
And that's a very good point. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I'll give them five. You I think give that them five? you know. I think it took. I think it took a heck of a lot of risks to go on stage, whatever. Because the Romans, you know, mm. death was very immediate for a lot of people in Rome in stage in stages for you know, gladiators to you exactly. Know. You just go okay, go from the stage into the arena, stabby stabby, as I say. Yeah, I think you were always risking because you never knew who you were going to offend. That's going to be a you know. That's true. So moving on finally to legacy. Well. Mm. As we talked about in Fireside, Roman theatre is the beginning of British theatre as we know it. So its legacy is huge. I mean, it's kind of how we got stages and performers and an audience dynamic. There's also a lot of direct influences of the work of Roman theatre. So, for example, mm-hmm. the work of Seneca was rediscovered in the 16th century. Mm-hmm. And the, he had huge influence on the Renaissance and French neoclassical tragedy and the Elizabethan tragedy. So when we talk about the Shakespeare works of Hamlet and Titus Andronicus, they have revenge themes and... I mean, when I was thinking Seneca, I was going, you know, Titus Andronicus. Literally, it's... And also, I want to say, Hamlet has a lot of ghosts. Yeah, and, and Seneca Macbeth. put and Macbeth too, and Seneca put ghosts in his work. Um, and we also look at John Webster's Duchess of Malfi and the Revenge as tragedy, and they've all got ghosts and witches and cool tyrants and themes of oh, vengeance. Kind of stuff. Terence, Mm -hmm. good old Terence, he was huge during medieval times. There are something like six hundred manuscripts of his work. Basically, he was used as the go-to way of learning Latin by monks and priests. Um, and for most of the Western history, he's been regarded as a big ce- celebrity. And he's also considered the first playwright of colour, which is, I mean, we just don't know about him at all, really. That's fascinating. And he, you know, he only wrote six plays. Mm. Also, Platus had a huge influence. The duck bill Platypus. <laughs> duck bill Platypus. Um, um, these characters in his plays were evident throughout history. So the direct influence of the theatre on... The, th- the structure of theatre and also mm. the theatre works is huge, I think, for Roman theatre. So I've given it a 9 out of 10. Oh, that's very high. Which is very high, I'm aware. I so. my, my, my question on it mm. is how much of this could also be said of the Greeks? I mean, how much are they in a... That is true. Well, knowing me, I'd probably also give the Greeks 9 out of 10. Yeah, for all their kind of... I mean, most of Roman theatre came from Greek theatre. We know that. As mm. They literally took... Yeah, the Greek theatre and wrote it all themselves and did it in a Roman version. Or mm. some not a Roman version, some just a Greek version. I think I'm going to give it a seven and a half. <gasps> seven and a half. Well, because it's a it's a difficult question, but I think mm. that a lot of it is, it's really interesting how much education, especially later on, but for the actual kind of impact in theatre, if we're kind of looking at legacy mm. or. I don't know, it's kind of like, it's how much of the legacy is their own in a, mm. in a weird way. It's also worth noting that after the Romans left, theatre disappeared for about 500 years. So or like their particular kind of staging. Their particular theater. staging yeah. disappeared. Mm. We entered the Dark Ages and, and it doesn't it doesn't stick around. It's I not... mean, the next true purpose-built theatre was built uh, in about 1570. So, yeah. yeah, we've got a long, long time. Yeah, still wait. Over a thousand that. years. Yeah. So, do you know what? I'm with you. I'm going to give it a seven and a half to okay. make it a round number of 15. It's up there for Terence. It has it's, to be. It, I just love Terence. Terry, as I call him. And he, <laughs> and he, you know, if he did die at 25, that's only two years older than me. And he written six plays that were... It's kind of... I think he was almost like a pre-Shakespeare in terms of his effect. If you think mm. about how we're still performing Shakespeare now, yeah. 400 years later... People were still talking about Terence 400 years, longer than 400 years. Yeah, I think, yes. I think the reason it can't be higher is, again, because we don't know now. That's true. That we've sort of forgotten all about Terence, which is sad. All right, so what's the grand total? The grand total is... Drumroll, please. Maths is very hard, and I realised that was wrong. Mm -hmm. Grand total is 44 out of 80. That's going very well, over half. It's, he's, he's... You've written 88. <laughs> I've written 44 out of 88, which is just wrong. <laughs> my maths and my spelling and my pronunciation of words is just not agreeing with yeah. me. So 44 out of 80. I think that's a good score for Roman theatre. Mm. Considering we don't know that much about the playwrights. Yeah. We only know about three playwrights mainly. Considering... We don't really know that much about Roman theatre in Britain specifically. We yeah. can just guess that it was 
similar to what was similar going on. Similar to what was going on in Rome. Pro- and probably even more orthodox, because that's again mm. the thing which happens with you know, establishments of power, that the, uh, that the culture becomes much more rigid further yeah. away from the capital. So, you know, conjecture again, educated guessing. Educated guessing. All right. <laughs> so, so is it, how does it have that certain special something that means it should, uh, should be performed for eternity in our house of rebels? I think it does. And I know I can feel like I'm going to say that for every single yeah. theatre style we do. But I just love the idea, two things I love. I love the idea of an actor on a crane. I love the idea of people actually having sex off on stage. Mm-hmm. And I love the idea of Terence. And Terence just, you know. I think there's a lot for Terence. I just, how many Roman plays do we know? And how much is, you know, it's a, and how much do we know of, I mean, I and think. Most Roman plays were basically the Greek Latin plays. version of Greek plays. Yeah. How much was it different in it terms of, you know. Mm. And like it's all like it's great that it was used for learning Latin, but I don't think we'd want to put, you know, put that in there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if, if if the House of Revel has like a little library somewhere where people study, we'd put it in like a, a house of, of schooling. Yeah. But I, I definitely what, think it's in the house of schooling. It's definitely not... in the house somewhere. It's just maybe not in the dining hall with all the... So maybe it doesn't make it into no, the house. I, I'm not sure it does, unfortunately. <sighs> I just... I love Terence. So I think Terence should... Everyone should know more about Terence. We'll, we'll put a picture of Terence. Yeah, Terence is on the wall. Terence is on the wall. He's an influence yes. there. Yes. So that is Roman theatre in Britain. Exciting. A very long, long, long history. Well, who knows? You know, who I might, knows? I, I might edit most of it. Yeah, you might just get all of it out. Yeah, and in that case, that is fair because I do waffle. Um, cool, no, wonderful. All um, right, that is the end of episode two of House, House of, of Rebels. Rebels. I hate us. I hate us too. Agamemnon. Agamemnon. Agamemnon.